Hi, this is Professor Stan Zygmunt of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Valparaiso University. And this is an introduction to using the computer program VASP for computational molecular and solid state physics. First, an overview of what I hope to achieve in this video. I want to talk about the goals of computational molecular and solid state physics. Then, the method that VASP uses to do quantum mechanical modeling of systems, including molecules and solids. Then we'll move on to the results. When a VASP calculation is completed, we obtain the equilibrium geometry of the system, its energy, and various properties that we can calculate. And finally, what are the applications? What types of research projects can we carry out with VASP? These primarily fall into the area of understanding the relationship between the structure of the physical system and the properties that it has with these examples. When we use VASP to study a physical system, whether that's a molecule or a solid, what are our goals? Well, first, we only want to start with the atomic numbers of the atoms and the fundamental equations of quantum mechanics. Primarily, this is the Schrodinger equation. With these starting points, we aim to calculate the minimum energy positions of all the atoms in the system. That's another way of saying determine the equilibrium structure of the system. Having determined the structure when the system is most stable, we want to calculate important physical properties. Some of these properties we will be able to compare to experimental results, and we certainly want to do that when it's possible. And overall, the overarching goal is to gain fundamental, fundamental physical understanding of the relationship between the system structure and its properties. So, VASP stands for Vienna Ab Initio Simulation Package. Ab Initio is just a fancy way of saying from first principles. We're not going to smuggle into the calculations the results of any experiments. Everything that we calculate will be from scratch, given only the atomic numbers and the Schrodinger equation, which you see here. VASP uses periodic boundary conditions to do the calculations. It treats the very important and difficult to calculate electron-electron interactions using density functional theory. It also writes down these wave functions, the psi that's in the Schrodinger equation here, it writes those down as a sum of simple plane wave functions. And it includes the influence of the core electrons, the ones that are closest to the nucleus that generally don't strongly influence the chemical bonding of atoms, it includes those using a technique called pseudopotential theory. So we'll go through these one at a time very briefly. In periodic boundary conditions, we take the system that we're going to study, and you can see in the center square here, that's composed of these five atoms, and it makes a copy of that system in all directions in space. This fundamental square here in two dimensions, if it were a three-dimensional system, it would be a cube. Uh, that is repeated over and over again. So we call that a periodic system. And it's designed to be a good description of bulk systems, macroscopic systems that have a repeated ordered structure that goes on and on in space. And periodic boundary conditions get rid of the surfaces, which are actually pretty difficult to treat uh, using quantum mechanics. Uh, using these periodic boundary conditions makes the calculations go faster. And although it's designed for a solid where the atoms are repeated over and over again in space, we can still use it to study molecules, isolated molecules, but we have to use a large cell. Uh, in other words, these five atoms would have to be put at the center of a very large cube in order that they don't interact strongly with the neighboring atoms in the next cell. So if we're really only interested in calculating the properties of a molecule, we have to use a larger unit cell. Density functional theory, uh, I'm just going to very briefly talk about the basic concepts of it. First of all, the name, what's a functional? A function of another function is called a functional. And the electronic energy density for the electron-electron interactions in a molecule or a solid uh, is an example of a functional because it depends on the charge density. 
which is a, a property of all points in space. So rho here represents the charge density, and the epsilon, representing this electron-electron interaction, is a function of a function, which is the charge density. And uh, this simple kind of representation is called the local density approximation because the electron-electron energy density only depends on the value of the charge density at all points in space. We can make this a little bit uh, more accurate in order to take into account the properties of systems where some of the electron spins are not paired up with other electron spins. And so when this electron-electron energy density is expressed as a function separately of the spin up and the spin down electron densities, this is called local spin density approximation. But for even more improved accuracy, and this is what VASP is able to take advantage of, we not only include what's the charge density at all points in space for the spin up and spin down electrons, but what's the gradient of the charge density for both of those kinds of electrons. So in other words, it's, it's not enough to just know what the charge density is at all points. We want to know how it's changing from point to point. And these kinds of versions of density functional theory collectively are referred to as the general gradient, generalized gradient approximation. So the strategy is from some very rigorous calculations that can be done on atomic systems, what we want to do is try to come up with a fitting function for this electron-electron interaction energy and determine the parameters that will make that function best fit the results of these rigorous calculations on atoms. So we're not using any experimental data, we're just trying to come up with an approximation for how the electrons interact with one another in molecular and solid systems. Well I said that we want to write down the wave functions, these expressions for psi, as a sum of plane waves. So you'll see this familiar e to the i k dot r, which is the functional form of a plane wave, and uh, we have to include many, many of these plane waves in order to represent uh, the wave functions that are appropriate for uh, atoms and, and molecules. But the uh, wave vectors, the k values that are included in this sum, are not uh, arbitrary. The, the ones that have to go into that sum are determined by the symmetry of the crystal, the arrangement of the atoms uh, in the unit cells. We also then uh, have to use some judgment to set the energy cutoff, which would be the maximum energy plane wave that we would use in this expansion, uh, and that is related to the maximum wave vector k that we would have to use in the sum. And the, the reason for doing this, because these linear combinations will include, in general, hundreds of these plane wave functions, the reason we want to do this is it's much easier to do calculations with plane waves compared to localized orbital functions, the kind of functions that you might be familiar with from uh, your studies of atomic theory. So s and p and d orbitals uh, that you might have in hydrogen atom. So one of the other characteristics of true atomic and molecular wave functions is that they tend to have uh, oscillations in them as you get close to the nucleus. So uh, here you can see the solid line represents the all electron wave function. If we want to take into account uh, all of the electrons in the system, the wave function would have some of these ripples in it near the nucleus. And this is a plot of the wave function plotted against position, the distance away from the nucleus. And, uh, and that wave function would be determined by the potential energy function here, which has the Coulomb type potential shown as the solid line in the bottom of the figure. Now here's the insight of pseudopotential theory. We can actually define a pseudopotential, and which is the dotted line potential here, such that the solution for the wave function that goes along with that pseudopotential would be something that would have a smooth variation near the nucleus. And that is what the pseudo wave function represents. But the important point is, beyond a certain radius, beyond a certain cutoff radius, the pseudo wave function and the rigorous all electron wave function will be identical. And so if we can do this, since it's the wave function in the regions outside the core electrons, the so-called valence electrons, 
those are the ones that primarily determine the bonding properties of molecular systems. Then we can simplify our calculation and use the pseudo wave function instead of the all electron wave function. So when we do this, the pseudo wave function requires fewer plane waves to expand. Generally speaking, the more oscillations or wiggles the, the wave function has, the more plane waves it takes to capture that kind of oscillation. So if we use the pseudo wave function instead, we can use fewer plane waves in our expansion. So those are the approximations that VASP uses. What are the results? I've already mentioned this uh, in the introduction. The results of a VASP calculation, when we put into it uh, a certain arrangement of atoms that form a molecule or a solid, what VASP will do is determine what the equilibrium structure of those atoms is. And so the, it'll give us the positions of all of the atoms in the system that will make the system the most stable. Of course, having the structure, it also then is able to calculate the total electronic energy associated with that structure. And then if we need to or want to, we can also find the energy levels, or if it's a, a solid system, the energy bands of that system. And those would be important in determining, uh, for example, optical properties. Because if the system's going to absorb photons, the electrons would jump up to higher energy levels. So those energy levels or energy bands might be very important. And as well, once we've calculated the equilibrium structure, uh, the wave functions associated with that will determine what the total charge and the total spin for each atom happens to be. So what's an example of an application of uh, VASP in a, a research project? And the one I've picked is the one that I use in my research quite often and it sometimes is called computational chemistry. Imagine that we have two molecules, or perhaps a molecule and a solid, uh, that, that come together and react. So some chemical bonds are broken, new chemical bonds are formed, and there's a product molecule that emerges. So what VASP would be useful for in order to study that reaction process, we would want to use it to calculate the reactant structure what the product structure would be at the end of the reaction, and then, ideally, we'd like to calculate the intermediate steps that go between the reactant and the product structures. And chemists call this pathway the minimum energy reaction path. And the reason that we want to do that is if we can find this minimum energy reaction path, it'll allow us to determine the activation energy for the reaction. And that's a property that can be measured experimentally, so we can test our calculations against experimental results. But the calculations will also give us some information that's not easily available from experiment, where we can actually visualize which bonds are being broken and formed and how that takes place. So schematically, here is a plot on the vertical axis of energy and then on the two horizontal axes, these represent positions of atoms that are involved in a system as it goes from a reactant through what's called a transition state. It has to climb an energy hill to get up over this, inter this uh, transition state structure, goes to an intermediate structure, and then in order to get to the final product structure, it has to climb over another energy hill represented by this second transition state in order to get to the products. And this meshed diagram is called a potential energy surface. In reality, for all but the very simplest of systems, this function is something that's re really difficult to uh, illustrate because there are hundreds of coordinates for all the atoms in the system. And uh, this is just a schematic that is something that we can visualize when we've only got two geometrical parameters. So in a simplified one-dimensional sketch, the chemists sometimes call this a reaction coordinate diagram, uh, we plot energy on the vertical axis versus the reaction coordinate that's a, just a way of visualizing how the reaction starts off from a reactant structure, goes through the first transition state, and then to an intermediate structure, and then has to surmount a second transition state before it reaches the product structure. And I mentioned that if we can calculate the reactant and the product and any intermediates along with these two transition state structures, if we can do that, 
then the activation energy emerges directly from these calculated results. And that's what we can compare to experiments. So this is just one example of a kind of research project that we can use the VASP program to undertake. So there are going to be more videos in this series that will help you actually run VASP to set up input files and to interpret the results of output files and visualize the results. But I hope this has been a good introduction, an overview of what's going on when we use VASP to do molecular and solid state calculations.